Hey guys, welcome back. So today I brought home another storm responder generator. This one is in pretty good shape. It's complete and you can probably tell just by looking at it, it was well cared for, definitely stored indoors. Now it wouldn't be here if it didn't have a problem. So let me show you what that is. There's absolutely no compression. Yeah, that's not good. It ran out of oil and you can actually see bits of the engine sitting there in the bottom. So I knew that when buying this, that the engine was blown. I'm actually surprised it didn't punch a hole through the side here. That's usually what happens. So. Potentially the block could be saved and the engine rebuilt, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I have an extra Briggs & Stratton 10 horse engine, and this one should be a direct replacement to the one that's blown. All I have to do is get the old engine out, put this one in, and we should be good to go. So I want to get you set up in a stand. I want to pull the tank off the generator just so you can see better what's going on. Get that gen head off and swap the engines. So I was planning on pulling the spark plug and checking to see if the piston's moving, but based on the fact that there's no oil in this bits of the engine and the oil pan, I'm not gonna bother. So I'm gonna pull the stator off next, and luckily Briggs has this quick disconnect here on the outlets. Otherwise, I would definitely have to pull the wires off of the stator before trying to slide this out. So if I'm really lucky, I only need to remove the brushes and if the bearing doesn't hang up, I can just slide everything out. If I'm unlucky and I need to use a puller, then I'm gonna to have to pull the wires, the AVR, and just get it all out of the way so that I can get the stator off. And just take note, the red usually goes on the left, and that's what it is here. It's also marked by a yellow indicator here, which has a plus. So now this end is floating and what I'm going to do now is just stick a board down there to kind of let this thing hover out in space. I remove these bolts and hopefully this whole thing slides out. So next I'm going to remove these four bolts. but. Before doing so, I'm actually gonna try torquing it down to see at what point does the bolt start turning. I'm expecting it to be somewhere between 60 and 100 inch pounds. Uh, I got the wrench set to 80, and 
We'll start with this one, see if it turns. And it does not. So now I'm trying 100. Didn't move. All right, that last one was 120. I thought it moved a bit. So now I'm gonna try 130. Yep, it's turning. So it's probably around 120. That's actually a little higher than I normally go. Usually I'll stop at 100. So, you know, I'd rather have it a little bit loose than to strip out the bell housing. Okay, let's see if we get lucky and this thing just slides out. Okay, yeah, this is fighting me. I'm gonna have to use a puller. You do not want to crank down on this. You will break the end housing. Ask me how I know. That wasn't too bad. I didn't have to remove that many wires. I did just use a gear puller to apply light pressure until it slid off the bearing. And now, for the fun part, getting that rotor off. In order to get the rotor off, I have to lock up the engine. Usually I do that by pulling the spark plug out and stuffing rope in the cylinder to lock it up. In this case, that'll do no good since the piston is seized and the connecting rod's broken. So I need to get this blower housing off so I can hold the flywheel in place. But before this will come off, I have to get this top cover off, the carburetor off, and probably this weather shield off as well.
So this just has a plastic cooling fan. Sometimes it's cast, you know, the flywheel and the fan as one piece, in which case I might put channel locks on the fins to kind of keep it from spinning. And even if the fins were metal, you could break it doing it that way. So I'm just gonna use a strap that I've previously sacrificed. But the idea is you just wrap this around the flywheel, the metal part, tighten it up, and then attach the clip somewhere to keep things still. Similar to the stator bolts, I don't know what this should be torqued to. Generally, they're between 20 and 40 foot-pounds. So I'm going to start at 20, try tightening it, see if this thing turns at all. All right, not turning at 20. Let's try 25. Yeah, it did turn. So somewhere between 20 and 25 foot-pounds is where this was tightened to. If you've ever taken one of these apart that has an AVR, the only ones I've done, at least for Briggs and Stratton, are the ones that have a bridge rectifier. And those, you always have to tap threads. In this case, there might be threads already. I'm not sure what size that is, but I'm gonna try a few bolts and see if I can find one that fits. I'm starting to like this uh, AVR head. Usually I tap it to an M12, 1.25. And that's what this bolt is. You can tell I've used it a few times. Anyway, it fits perfectly. So this is gonna be pretty easy. So you just wanna get a measurement here. You wanna push the bolt in until it hits the shaft and then mark it. This will give you a rough length from the end here to where it hits the shaft on the engine. Now you want to get a rod, one that's larger in diameter. You don't want it to be the same size as this because what you're going to do is push the rod in and you'll mess up the threads. So you want it to be bigger so it doesn't actually go into the tapered shaft and destroy the threads. Anyway, you want to cut the rod to be a little bit shorter than this mark. So about a third of an inch shorter. And what that'll do is you can then put the rod in, it'll go in a third of an inch further than the end. You put the bolt in and just crank down and that will pop the rotor off of the tapered shaft. All right, so that's the rod I cut. Potentially a little bit short, but We'll give it a try. Actually, I think that'll work fine. Ideally, you would do this with something long, like a breaker bar. These things, they do require a bit of force and the rotor usually pops somewhat forcefully, it's gonna eject most likely. So you do wanna have a hand on it and the other hand on the wrench and try not to drop it.
we go. Thought the hard part was over, but there's two more bolts left holding this engine on. And you can see I already put WD-40 on it. I've already tried cracking this loose and it's not budging. So I'm gonna try hitting this with a hammer to see if I can't free it up. Otherwise, I can just unscrew the bracket from the bottom and leave the bracket connected to the engine, which is fine because I do have a couple extra, but I would like to just use these brackets if I could. Plan B. The last step here is to switch the bell housings. You can see the bell housing on this one's a lot more substantial. That's the one we need to put on to the new old engine. So I've already loosened the bolts on that one. I estimated it was around 25 foot-pounds, give or take. This one's a little interesting. It uses hex, hex head bolts. And I don't really have an appropriate set to take that off, assuming it's torqued to 25 or 30 foot-pounds. So I'm gonna have to try this. It's just a quarter inch socket to hold, I think it was a seven, 16ths hex head and I don't know if I'll get enough leverage and even if I do something might break but let's hope for the best I wire wheeled all the bolts, at least the part that's going to engage the threads. Now, I don't know the torque spec on this, but it looks like a grade 5 bolt. And I looked up torque specs going into aluminum for what looks to be a 3 8 inch bolt. And it comes up with a max of 24 foot-pounds, which seems about right. I was going to do 20. So I'll start with 20, and if it feels good, maybe I'll push it a little further. I'm also going to use some thread locker. These bolts had some on it when they came out, so I want to make sure those stay in, especially too, because if they do come out, they're going to start flying around where the fan is and destroy the fan. So I want to make sure these bolts stay tight. Okay, I'm gonna stay at 20 foot-pounds. I don't feel too good about pushing it up to the limit, which would be 24. If the threads were new, the bolts were new, sure, but that's not the case here. So this time I'm just gonna pull the plug and fill that cylinder with rope so that I can put the rotor on and torque it down.
So if I put enough rope in the cylinder, I should be able to tighten this down to 20 foot-pounds. I tested this before loosening it and did not turn at 20, it turned at 25. So I'm gonna start at 20 and maybe bump it up a little bit past that. Now, one question I'm asked a lot is, basically, it looks like I put the bolt on incorrectly because there's a lot of play. And when you tighten it up, it's pretty much impossible to get it dead center. It's usually always pushed to a side. And when I power this up, the bolt is wobbling. And I think that's normal, not too concerned about it. I mean, honestly, when you put the stator on and the end housing on the four bolts around, the whole thing's sandwiched together. It's not going anywhere. At that point, this bolt becomes a lot less important. But, you know, I'll try to keep it as centered as possible, but I can never get it. Okay, that's 20 foot-pounds. Take it up to 23. And we're at 23. I don't feel comfortable going anymore, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Okay, I got the rope out of the cylinder, and I'll put the stator on now. While I'm here, I'm just gonna clean the slip rings. Just be careful not to uh, knock the wire off. And this is just a Scotch-Brite pad. Just gonna tap on the end housing a bit to make sure that stator seats properly in the slip. Right now it's not seated. Okay, I'm gonna start with 40 inch pounds. Okay, and now 80. Okay, now I'm just gonna turn the engine over listening for any scraping, or even worse, if the engine binds because of something that I've done. There's a lot of noise up here, but I don't hear anything down here. So I think we're good to finish this thing up. Okay, I'm gonna start with the brushes. I don't know the torque spec on this, but it's very little. This strips out very easily. Just want to snug it up, that's it. Okay, plug the brushes in, reds on the left.
Okay, and that's almost it. We just gotta put this plug in the back here for the outlets and then attach the ground wire right there. Okay, I know I'm putting the cart before the horse, but this was bugging me. So I pulled the tin from the muffler with the blown up engine, and I'm gonna put that hopefully over here. And yes, I broke a bolt, but three will work just fine. Okay, ready to give this thing a try. Got a fuel line hooked up. Not a lot of gas in it. Probably run it for about a minute. So I haven't done anything to this engine since I got it, but I did check the oil. It's full of old oil. So plenty of oil to test with. And once it warms up, I'll change the oil. Also the carb I haven't serviced. So potentially that could be an issue as well. Okay, well, there's good news and bad news. I guess the good news first. Makes power. It, voltage was a bit low, like 113, 114. When I loaded it with 1500 watts, the voltage actually came up to 118, which is a bit odd, but whatever, we can adjust that. The more concerning thing is the engine speed was at about 61.8, and when I loaded it to 1500 watts, it dropped to 59 and a half. Now that's a pretty big drop considering this has a 5500 continuous watt rating. So I'm a little concerned actually about this engine. Let me refuel. I'm gonna bring out another space heater and try loading it to 3000. See how the engine holds out. Okay, let's try this again with 3000 watts.
Okay, not terrible, but not great. At least it was above 58 hertz under a 3000 watt load. So I'm gonna bring out another space heater. We'll try 4,500 watts. Also, the engine's making a lot of noise. It's actually not the engine. It's the starter assembly. It's rattling kind of on the engine. So the engine isn't quite as loud as it sounds. Ready to give this another try with 4,500 watts. And I did unbolt the AVR and I gave this potentiometer about a half a turn clockwise to get the voltage up. I'm gonna re-secure this now and then start it up and see, see where we're at for voltage and then try the load test. Okay, overall not too bad. I mean, this thing is doing what it's supposed to do. It's making power and it has a working engine. So my only reservation here is the fact that the engine is sagging more than it should. It's a 10 horse engine and under 4,500 watts, ideally it would stay above 58 hertz or even above 59 hertz, but it's at 56 point something. That's, that's too low it's definitely a sign that something isn't quite right with the engine. So I'm gonna dig into that a bit. It could be leaky valves, valve lash, dirty carb, or something to do with governor spring and linkage. And that's actually kind of where I'm leaning on this one because at one point when the engine was loaded up and running a bit slow, I just nudged the throttle plate open a bit more and it had no problem getting up to speed to 60, 61 hertz. It's just the governor wasn't allowing it to or commanding it to, to that speed. So, you know, there might, might be some adjustments we can make there, but I'm gonna get this back to the garage while it's hot, change the oil, and then we'll dig in up here and see if we can't find anything obvious wrong. Just want to show you on the blown up engine what I think the issue might be. You can see there's a bunch of holes here on the governor arm and the spring is attached and this spring is what pulls the throttle plate open and it's not until after the engine starts that the governor applies force to the shaft and starts closing the throttle. Now when the force decreases because the engine slows down this spring pulls the throttle back open but that's not happening. And it can be a lot of things on why there's so much RPM drop. But in this case, I think it's the sensitivity of the governor. And by bringing the spring closer to the shaft, it should decrease the RPM droop. So what I'm gonna do is move it one hole closer on the outside and that may actually, that will change the engine speed. I think it'll decrease it a little bit. So we're gonna have to reset the engine speed back up to 62 Hertz or 3750 RPM. And then I'll try loading it up again and see how we make out. Well, this would explain what we're seeing. The further away from the shaft you are, the less responsive it is 
to a load. And we're seeing, we're seeing that. So on the other engine, the blown up one, it was on the fifth hole, which is right there. And this one's on the seventh. So that would explain why this is not very sensitive to a load. I don't know if someone did this at some point or if this is how it came from the factory, but I'm gonna move it back to the fifth hole and it looks like that'll remove some spring tension. So most likely the engine's gonna run slow when I start it. I'll have to bend this tab to get it back to 62 Hertz and then we'll do another load test. Okay, good. I'm gonna leave this cover off just like this because if you go too far in, it becomes too sensitive and the engine will surge. I don't know if that'll be the case until we start it up and see what it does. Okay, just gonna start it up, check the speed and adjust it, then we'll load it up. Okay, good, that was a lot better. Usually I like setting engines around 61 and a half, and in this case, it's like 62.234, somewhere around there. Maybe a touch fast, but I've also seen plenty of manuals where it says to set it to 62 or 62 and a half. So I'm not gonna worry about it too much. The good news is at that speed, a 4,500 watt load doesn't slow the engine down too much. Uh, I think it was at 59.7, which is actually very good. So I think we're good. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm going to get this back inside the garage and just finish putting it together. All right, now that we're all good mechanically and electrically, I want to pretty this thing up again and make it look like it belongs on this engine. So I'm going to swap out the airbox cover with a storm responder one from the blown up engine. And also this cover here on the top is quite rusty. So I'm gonna try the, the blower housing from the blown up engine and see if it'll fit in this one's place. screws already missing.
So I stole a few bolts from the broken engine. It was missing one bolt down on the bottom right here. It's supposed to be one on the bottom, one on the top. And then on this side, it had the wrong bolt. It had this. And the threads actually look different, so I don't know if this is gonna fit, but it's supposed to have one like this, where this here is what holds the starter fan shroud in place, and then this is held on by this nut. So we'll see if I can get this to work, otherwise I might have to stick with the original. I got the heat shield in place. I've already tightened it down. There's one screw in each corner and those are tightened from the bottom. Also, there's two down here on this rail. So now I'm just gonna drop the tank in place and tighten that down. All right, and before putting the end cover on, uh, there was a specialty zip tie kind of holding this together, which isn't really needed for that because there is a clip here which latches this together. But I think more importantly, it had a hole and you could screw it right there to kind of keep this nicely secured. Uh, in this case, I mean, it would probably be okay just like this, but to be sure, I am gonna throw a zip tie probably around here. and then through here. Doesn't have to be too tight. Really, it's just to keep this from falling in or potentially moving down and just making contact with a moving part. Okay, it's all back together. Let's make sure it still works.
Okay, not too bad for a generator that had a blown engine. Anyway, it starts first pull, runs well, can support a load. Can't ask for much more. Hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.